You know, the United States loves to be confident and even overconfident, full of itself in terms of thinking we've got the greatest healthcare manpower team in the world. For the latest in health related information and ways to save your life, check out the newsletter. Well, you know what, when you look at public health, our lifespan, our actual health parameters, it's dismal. It's one of the worst among the developed or wealthier countries. Why is it so bad? Well, what we're going to cover today clearly shows one of the reasons. One of those reasons is that over half of the primary care and quote prevention that's provided to citizens of the United States is provided by doctors that have been hired by hospitals. Here's the problem with hospitals. They serve too many masters and they're addicted to money. So even though doctors will hire primary care doctors, they don't pay them to do primary care. They pay primary care doctors to do referrals in to their specialists. Hospitals really make their money off of specialist procedure fees. So specialists because they do the procedures, not the primary care doc, tend to be on the hospital board. So you see a major trend where over half of the healthcare, the primary care, the prevention is being delivered by doctors in primary care hired by hospitals who are actually being hired to refer patients to get procedures done. When I talk to primary care doctors that work for hospitals, they acknowledge, oh yeah, RBRVU. What is RBRVU? Resource-based relevant relative value units, which is exactly what this show, the topic, the uh, article, the research was about today. Even though hospitals say we have quality and we pay our primary care doctors for quality, no, they don't. They pay their primary care doctors for quantity and for referrals for RB, RB use. So before I get too deep into that, let's talk about uh, some other things. You know, if you've never been on this channel, here's what we do. I um, started off as an ER doc. I'm 65. And I was very, I was exceptionally young. I was in my very early 20s when I finished my medical education. So I started off as an ER doc and it became very clear. That was back in the day when we called them ER. Now we call them ED, ER, emergency room, ED, emergency department. So after seeing countless heart attacks in the mid 60s, strokes in the mid 60s, early 60s, even in the 50s, and every one of them should have been prevented. I said, look, it's fun. It's like being on a TV show, being an ER doctor, but that's not what's best for patients. What's best for patients is helping them learn and prevent these problems. So at that point in time, I said, you know, I really, really didn't want to do that. I grew up a couple of the things. There were two things that I never, ever would have wanted to be. One was a teacher. And every time I think of teacher, I remember the old Charlie Brown cartoons where they don't show the teacher, they give you Charlie Brown's and the kid's version of her voice and it's going, wow. That's what I always thought about teachers too. And, and I know that's totally inappropriate, but I didn't want to be a teacher. I didn't really disrespect teachers for the most part, but I did not want to be a teacher. The second thing that I did not want to be was a bean counter, an accountant. One of the guys with, you know, green eye shades and a pocket protector clicking uh, numbers. And neither one of those things appealed to me. Why am I going off down that bunny hole? Here's the issue. When I came to that epiphany, that point, when, when I remember seeing this, this was a 58 year old patient in the emergency department with a heart attack. You know, as I started digging deeper, we found it was very clear. He knew it was coming. He came from a family of people having heart attacks in their late fifties. And they just looked at it like, we've got a short lifespan. This is going to happen to us. And I was going, does that really have to happen? And the answer was no. And here was part of the problem. I knew that if I was going to start dealing with the root cause of that issue, I was going to have to become a teacher. You know, it's lifestyle. What you do, what a patient, what a person does on a daily basis, especially three times a day, if you eat three times a day, what you do in terms of eating is so important to your lifespan and your health, preventing cardiovascular disease 
like I go to school, I get admitted to med school, I go through all of that training in med school, and then I have to turn around and be a teacher and start sounding like that hurt to think that that was what I really needed to do. But I made that commitment at that point in time. I went to a place that clearly I thought was the best. I was surprised that I was able to get in, frankly. It was Johns Hopkins. And it turns out it was the best. You know, people like to say, well, no, maybe Harvard's better. Not in prevention. The Harvard programs, there's some things that Harvard's competitive with Hopkins on. In medicine, most not. Clearly not in preventive medicine. For example, typical department, the preventive medicine programs that Hopkins were twice as big and produced more than twice as much research in education. So I was very fortunate to be able to get into Hopkins. Then very fortunate, I loved what I was doing in prevention. I ended up doing very well. I became the head of the program in prevention and ended up running the program, ended up teaching doctors how to do prevention. One of the interesting things. Now, what does any of this got to do with being a bean counter? Well, one of the things you'll hear if you talk to somebody who learned medicine at Hopkins, you'll hear the term denominator medicine. And it's like, wait a minute, denominator is a math term, numerator over denominator. And here's what that means. So your typical doctor goes into a, an exam room, head down, talking one-on-one -on -one with a, an individual patient. We have a, a foot in two very, very different camps. The first camp is the patient, the numerator. And actually very few docs in prevention know that space. We had a separate space at Hopkins. In fact, we were the only place that had what we called clinical prevention programs, which were focused on individual one-on-one -on -one doctor patient relationships and the work that I do, for example, with my patient population now. The vast majority of docs were doing what we call denominator medicine. Another way of looking at it is instead of looking at all the diseases or disease processes in one patient at the time, Denominator medicine, preventive medicine, is looking at all of the population in one disease at the time. Flipped. Flip the ratio, flip the perspective. Why is that important? You see that as critical as healthcare is going from fee for service, which is extremely wasteful, as we get into fee for value, away from fee for service. We're doing that same flip in perspective.